But before we get to Daniel 6, I'd like to say a few things about angels. We started this last week, and, and angels are pretty, uh, we don't know much about them. Billy Graham did an excellent book on angels, and so did Dr. Jeremiah. Uh, and I think we need to, to learn more about angels, but we, we fell into that bizarre time in America where we were making angels not biblically. We were, we were taking angels and not applying biblical principles to them. You remember all the movies, the TV shows? Uh, and I think that craze is not so much here anymore, but around the world we always have people praying to saints, praying to angels, and, and I, if you trace back a lot of the false religions, it started because of an angel. Uh, but angels are created beings, just like we are. God created them. And as we learned in Sunday school with Marcia, you know, we can take God's creation and we learn something about God. And we can appreciate things about God through his created universe. And one of them are angels. We need to learn about angels, think about angels at times, and, and learn, and, and it's like an affront to God when we don't do this, but we need to be careful. But angels, like I mentioned, are created beings just like you and me. Uh, they were made in Christ, and through Christ, and for Christ. And you know, in Colossians, you don't have to go there, but Colossians 1, starting at verse 15, Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15, it says, he is the image of the invisible God, that's Christ, the firstborn over all creation. Now before we move on here, that word firstborn has caused a lot of angst and has even spun, sprung some false religions by not interpreting this word uh, firstborn correctly. Firstborn uh, means preeminence or first in order or first above all. And we have religions out there, organizations, that say because Christ is described as firstborn, he's at the first created being. They even go as far as to say that he's Michael the Archangel, or he's like the highest of the created beings, angel of some sort. And that's not what the verse is saying. When it says Christ is a firstborn over creation, he's saying that he's first in, because he's the creator, he's first in rank, first in premiums, first in everything. And you know what? When you go like, we're going to write this down, Psalm 89, verse 27. In Psalm 89, verse 27, it says, it uses the same verse to describe David. And it says, also I will make him my firstborn. He's talking about David. The highest of the kings of the earth. Okay, that's the same word that's being used. And we all know that David was not the first king, Saul was. But even more to the fact, David was the last born in his family. Remember when Samuel came and, and, and said one of Jesse's sons is going to be the next king, and he had all six of them come up and stand in front of him. And the Lord kept saying, not him, not him. And then he said, do you have another son? Yes, was one the last born, the seventh, out in the fields. So, but David is described as the firstborn of all kings. In other words, he's the prototype. He's the first um, in rank over all kings. It's the same word that's being used. Jesus Christ is first in rank because he is the creator of all things. And we're going to see in verse 16. For by him, by Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Where the thrones or dominion or principalities or powers, that's angels, all things are created through him and for him. And I, I have to add verse 17. And he is before all things. Well, that explains firstborn. But then he says, and in him all things consist. In Christ all things consist. Those are some of my favorite verses. That's always struck me. In him, Christ holds the entire universe together. He could wipe it out in any second, at any time. Remember when Christ says to the Pharisees, my father is working and I am working? They knew what he was saying. He was saying, I'm equal with God Father. But he's a faithful God. 
He's a loving God. And he, that's not his nature, just to wipe everything out. But he, it's just in him. All creation consists in him, including angels. God decides what form he will give angels according to his sovereign good pleasure. And at times, the Lord allows us to see them. And I would think most likely in human form. And, you know, sometimes in Scripture, you know, you go to Daniel chapter 10, you have Daniel and his companions at the Tigris River, and an angel appears to Daniel. His companions didn't see the angel, but Daniel did. So many times, uh, only one person in a whole set of people will see the actual angel. Many times animals are able to sense or see the angelic presence, just like Balaam's donkey. You know, and we talked about that last week. But you know what? I think the greater miracle is that someone like Balaam wasn't able to see the angel. The Lord allowed him to see it. But you know, angels get so absorbed in their work that even their appearance is governed by their assignment. Uh, depending on the task God gives each one, uh, they remain invisible to our eyes. 99.9% .9 of the time, angels are in this room right now. They're observing us, worshiping the true God. And I'm, I'm sure angels are also holding back demonic forces. But they're in this room right now, watching us, observing us. Uh, and God gives them this task to serve us in this world. And... and they, like I said, they usually take on a human form. But you know, one thing about angels, they don't want us to worship them. Then. It's repugnant to them. They don't want us to pray to them. They're here to watch us to, to do God's will, not their will. They're not here to communicate to us. Because what is it saying, Galatians 1 8? But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you, and we have preached you, let that person be accursed. So they're, they're here to do God's will, which we're going to see in a minute in Daniel 6. They're here to do His will, and His will, not our will, but God's will. And, and you know, the Bible instructs us to test every spirit, and that's what angels are. They're spirits. Demons are unclean spirits. But, you know, you, you 1 John chapter 4, you know, verses 1 through 3, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So suppose an angel did appear to you with some message from God. Now I'm saying an actual angel. Would you be more excited about God's message or seeing an angel? Don't answer that. <laughs> Just think about it. Really think about that. And you know what? what we, see is we see a certain pattern in Scripture when it comes to angels. Number one, they're never the main thing. And wherever an angel appears, they're never the main thing. There's always another theme that's attached to it. But also, uh, uh, they, what are they going to say? Most of the time, I'm going to say maybe all the time, when angels appear to somebody like Manoah and his wife and, and throughout a battle, and, and Daniel, we're going to see in a minute here, it's always... People aren't seeking to see an angel. We have that today. We have people, I, what's that place, Brazil or somewhere? I, I forget where it's at. Where they, Because an angel's been there or something, they go there. I don't know what the whole story is. But there's actually people praying to angels, trying to seek angels' uh, presence. And when you look through the Bible, those that are, they're not people, angels, when they appear to somebody, it's not because they've been praying or seeking an angel, they've been seeking God, and God sends the angel. Those are the people that will actually see God. They're not seeking the angel. So I, I go back to that question again. If you're seeking God's will, and God sends, like Zachariah in the temple, sends an angel to appear to you to, to answer, are you going to be more shocked? 
or not I'm going to say shocked, you can be more excited about the angel appearing to you or that God is speaking to you. And I think when that, if that time ever comes, you're going to be more excited about God than the angel. And I have to say, before we get into Daniel 6, John. John in Revelation. I think it's twice, maybe three times, John fell down at the angel's feet. And what did the angel do? The angel said, get up, worship God only. Worship God only. That's why it's repugnant to angels that we pray to them or give them so much attention. Because it's all about, they're here to, 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 to reflect and give, they're a messengers of God, not messengers for, of us, but messengers of God. And they exist for a reason. They exist because they're God's servants. And because there's so many angels, Patrick knows that now, that appear in heaven, it seems like there's a lot of action going on in heaven, and there is. And when we get there, I suppose that we wouldn't be able to keep up with the angels if it weren't for our, the fact that we're getting new spiritual bodies fit for that environment. But the heaven is a busy place with angels. And that just blows me away because when we get to heaven, when we go into heaven, we're going to see millions and millions of angels. And I have a feeling that they're all in different form. They're all different. And, and, but uh, Satan was created an angel. He was the highest angel. And when you go to like Isaiah chapter 14, I believe, my opinion, that they're describing Satan in Isaiah chapter 14. And Satan was, was created to glorify God. And, but instead of serving and praising the Lord, Satan wanted to rule uh, heaven in the place of God. And when you go to Isaiah 14, notice the five I wills. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the Mount of Congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. The I will is a spirit of rebellion. It's in us. That's why Christ has to say all the time, die to self. If you want to be my disciple, you have to die to self. And what does it say in Ephesians chapter 2? The spirit of the air is, is uh, ruling the sons of disobedience. That spirit of the air is Satan. It's demons that are ruling this world right now. And that, that, that as sons of disobedience in our sin, we follow them instead of God. When God comes, we place our faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit regenerates us, gives us a new spirit. Now we have the Holy Spirit in us. And now we're starting to be transformed more into Christ's likeness. And we're dying to self. It's, only, we're not, it's not about us anymore. It's about God first, other people sank it, and we're continually becoming more like Christ. And you know, I, this, I have to be careful what I say here, but Satan and his demons are known for their discord that they promote. Okay? The, the wars that they start, uh, the hatred and the murder that they initiate, and the opposition to God and his commandments. But we don't want to be like Flip Wilson. Remember what he made famous? The devil made me do it because we're responsible. Yes, there's a spiritual warfare going on that we don't see with the angels and demons, but we are responsible for every decision we make, every choice we make, we're held responsible. And we see this in Daniel chapter 6. We see how the people are jealous of Daniel, and they seek to kill him because they're ruled by the spirit of the air, Satan. Angels, on the other hand, take joy in obeying the Lord. And they seek to do His will by what? By protecting us. Remember that angel last week in, in Balaam? He came to, to keep Balaam from continuing on, or he would kill him. The angel had no hesitation of killing Balaam if God told him to. We're going to see the same thing here with Daniel. In Daniel chapter 6, I'm going to read the first nine verses. Please listen carefully, but this is God's word. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom, and over these 
three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault, because he was faithful. Nor is there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel, lest we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors, have consulted them together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for thirty days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. So Daniel has been faithfully serving in the kingdom for seventy years, for roughly seventy years. And now he's about 85. And I don't have to say this to this congregation at all. But even though he was 85, retirement was not on his mind. You know, we're always going to be serving the Lord. Until he takes us home, we're going to be serving him. And we serve him through our prayer life. We serve him by being here uh, committed to a true church where, where we serve him. Just our presence in our neighborhood. We're always serving God. And for those that can't, I've said this before many times, but for those that maybe are homebound and, and maybe they don't see anybody <coughs> a lot, you're still serving God by your attitude, by your prayer life, by your uh, uh, worshiping of God, by your thinking of God. Because who's watching? God is, of course, but so are the angels. So are the angels are watching. We're going to see next week when we get to 1 Peter what angels desire to look into. It's us, beloved. Because I'm going to tell you something really fast. God didn't come as a savior for angels. He came for savior for mankind. He came as a human being, not as an angel. Angels do not have a savior. And they wonder, they marvel that the God that they worship in, in eternity the holy, sinless God that they bow down and worship would come down here, take upon himself humanity, become a sinless sacrifice for these worms down here. For these ungrateful, sinful, rebellious human beings. They marvel at that. And you know what? This is why I say don't put angels on a pedestal because they don't want to be on a pedestal. You know what's going to happen when you die and you go to heaven? You're the bride of Christ. You are the bride of Christ. They're not. And there's something that you experience that the angels can never experience. And that's having an intimate relationship with the Savior. But anyway, Daniel, he's 85. And he, the retirement's not on his mind. And, and I like the word in verse 3. This is important. In verse 3 when it says... Uh, distinguished himself. Distinguished himself. It's that pesky participle again, and that's important because what that means is it stresses the fact that Daniel is continually distinguishing himself, or, or I would say, growing mature in the faith continually. The whole time he was a believer, let's say 70 years, he's always uh, progressing in the Christian faith. He's becoming more like God's image. And people recognize that. Darius recognized that. People recognize that. And when it talks about uh, an exceptional spirit or excellent spirit in him, it's saying, it's referring to his good attitude and abilities, which obviously manifested itself through his faith. We're, we should be known as joyful people. You are, we are. We are joyful people in the Lord. And it makes an impact. You may not think you make an impact, but you do make an impact. Right here in your family circle, in Klamath Falls, jobs, everywhere, you're making an impact because people are watching you. 
or Athena is one of these Christians, or Teresa is one of these Christians, I'm going to watch her. Matter of fact, I might set some traps up at, at work because I know she's just like me. She, she thinks she's so different. They think they're so different than us. And they wait for you to fall. They wait for you to stumble. Then they can point to Charlie and say, I see, I told you he's just like me. There's nothing. But, beloved, you make more of an impact than you think as a Christian. And so we have these save traps. Save traps are like the, the, the Congress. Okay? You have your three governors that were over everybody, then you had a, 120 save traps. Save traps were over like the, the provinces. They were over like five or six different provinces. They were below the governors and obviously below the Darius. And they were furious because Daniel, a holdover from the pagan Babylon, was above them. And they, they coveted that one position, one of three positions. So what they did is they went and they deceived Darius. And Darius finds this out. But he, they, they say, okay, let's find something that we can accuse him uh, in his uh, political realm, in his job duties. And they couldn't find anything. So they said, but I know one thing that we can accuse him of, something to do with his religion. Since we can't find any other fault in him, let's find a fault with his religion. So what they do is they say they've been watching Daniel, just like they watch you, the unbelieving world watches you. They watch and they know Daniel has set times during the day that he prays. So and he knows he'll never compromise his faith. That's a compliment to Daniel. He knows that he will never comp compromise his faith. So let's do this. Let's go to Darius and, and, and tell Darius that everybody worship you alone or send prayers to you alone for a month, whatever long it was, knowing that Daniel would never compromise his faith. And they waited for that. And so they, they, um, Daniel had to make a choice, either to, to obey God or obey man. And, and his convictions were definitely not hidden. He wasn't a secret disciple, and you're not. We're not secret disciples. We wear our Christianity on our heart. Everybody knows you're a Christian. Uh, when you get to, uh, but before we get to verses 10 through 18, understand that in verse 6 when it talks about, where is it here? So these governors and satraps throng before the king. That word throng it is it, it meaning it's we went as a group. And it has the idea of conspiracy is what the idea is. And it's, so it's not an innocent calm people uh, but it's a picture of a mob that is furious and has hatched a deceitful plan to get rid of their enemy. Daniel. Now you look at verses 10 through 18 it says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show a due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes the petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then three men, these men, approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king established may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet, signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. You know, as our country becomes more secular, 
we're going to find ourselves taking stands that are unpopular in positions that may even violate the law of the land. And you're going to have to make that choice whether you're going to obey God or man. Uh, Daniel doesn't, look at Daniel. He doesn't question, doubt, or worry. Okay, he simply obeys his God. And notice that he doesn't bow toward Darius, but toward Jerusalem. Darius is not the object of his prayers, only God. How many times do we give up false prayers to impress people here in the congregation? Or we, you know what a bully pulpit is? A bully pulpit is something that a pastor will come up here or is ever speaking up here and and he'll say, I'm going to go after Brenda. I'm going to go after Marge because it's something I think she needs to change. And so they attack him. And somebody asked me the, uh, the other week, or whenever it was, but I make my notes up month to two months in advance. And it's a horrible thing when somebody uses a bully pulpit. It is. Just let the word of God flow. He's going to speak to wherever he wants to speak at any time. And it's, it's not a good thing. You, well, we've all been in this situation. I haven't for years, probably for 10 or 15 years. You know, actually, it happened at Boise. We, we'd have a prayer meeting, and, and, and some person was there just to either hear the gossip or, or, or to make a point to somebody else in the prayers. But we, we don't. So Daniel, he, he's, he's disciplining himself to pray three times a day. And he's not a hypocrite. He's, he's opening his window. He's on the top floor. So nobody sees him except the determined spies because they know exactly where he's going to be at and when he's going to pray. But he's not praying to impress people because he's above. He's, he, nobody can see him praying. He opens the windows and he's praying to God to, towards Jerusalem. And so this prayer, this description of the prayer is a statement that he's neither flaunting nor hiding his religious practice. Okay? Think of some, I'll just say this really fast, I'm guilty of this. Think of some lame excuses that stop us from a faithful, consistent prayer life. Here's Daniel. He's in death sentence. And yet he still goes home and he prays like he always does. What, what are some excuses we make? We have to get our work done, so I just don't have time to pray. We need more sleep, so we don't have time to pray. Or we're just too busy. You know, it, it's because it's spiritual warfare going on in prayer. Prayer is one of the hardest disciplines you will ever encounter. And sometimes we need to discipline ourselves. It's like Daniel. There's nothing wrong with Daniel praying set times every day. I do that because, or I won't pray. Because, man, it's the hardest thing. But once you start, the prayer lists are really good, Connie. Because if you just start going down the prayer list, even though it may seem mechanical to you, guess what? The Holy Spirit is going to take over and you're going to just start praying. But anyway, these jealous spies finally catch Daniel and they report it to the king. Now look what happens with Darius. First of all, they describe Daniel as one of the exiles in order to dehumanize him. You know, it would be like saying t today to uh, one, of these, one of those Christians who go against our laws. They're intolerant. I uh, claim that our laws contradict and compromise the Bible. You're going to hear that more and more today. Oh, text, man, he's, he's, he's so intolerant. He's got this caveman attitude because he reads the Bible. And he's saying that certain laws that we pass are sin. It's coming. It's, it's going to happen. We'll see if this gets on Facebook. Anyway, <laughs> the king was furious, not because Daniel was praying since he realized he had been duped. He was furious. Because he thought, he liked Daniel. He liked Daniel. But, uh, and he thought when these safe traps came with an ulterior motive and said, King, let us all honor you for 30 days and just pray to you. He thought, okay, that's a good idea. But they did that not to honor Darius, but to get rid of Daniel. They had an evil motive behind it, and Darius knew it. Darius knew it. And so he's furious, but he knows he can't go against what he's already written down as law. Now look at verses 19 through 28. Actually, probably read through 23. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. 
Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in, and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out to, with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever is found on him because he believed in his God. The angel here, we don't know uh, whether it was one or two angels. We don't know if Daniel saw the <coughs> angel. Uh, and, and so Daniel's let down in this, this den, and these lines are there. And he noticed Darius doesn't get any sleep, but Daniel, I think, slept really well. <laughs> and so Daniel, he probably saw this angel holding back the lines and felt secure. And that's what we need to do, beloved. We have angels around us, angels that God will send to protect us, angels that are here to serve us. And so Daniel, he gets, he, he, he gets, Darius comes to the, to the den and he, he's anxious. He thinks the lions have just torn him apart. And he says, uh, Daniel, have your, has your God saved you? Notice he says, your God. He doesn't say my God, he says, your God. We have many, we probably have more non-believing friends than believing friends. And that's a, that's a compliment. We shouldn't turn people off. We need to be attracted to them, but that doesn't mean we compromise our, our uh, witness and our gospel either. But here's the thing that you didn't hear about probably in Sunday school. In verse 24 it says, And the king gave the command. And they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. Then their children and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Sometimes the Bible is disturbing. Why is the scripture saying this? You know, you can go back to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, remember his three friends were being thrown into the furnace of fire? And the fire was so hot that the guards that took these three men to throw them into the furnace were burned to death. It was so hot. Remember that? The guards were killed, but the three in there weren't. And there was an angel. Sometimes I like to know I won't get into I think it might have been Christ, but an angel of the Lord with them in the fire furnace. And they came out, and what happened? They came out, and they didn't even smell the smoke. And they could not say... Well, it's because the fire wasn't hot enough or something happened because the guards were killed right alongside them before they were thrown. And here, the den of lions, you can hear this, especially when we're talking about atheism today. You, you would hear, if God didn't have this verse in here, you would hear, well, the, maybe the lions were just too fat. Maybe they were drugged. Maybe they, somebody had fed them before they put Daniel in there. What does Darius do? He throws the other people in there, and they're killed before they even hit the ground. So you can't say that they were fed before they were drugged. And what's the scripture telling us? Beloved, scripture is telling us that God's going to get the glory. And your life is going to get the glory and people are going to know it. And people, there's no excuse. On the day that we die, if you have not accepted Christ, there's going to be no excuse. You have all the rational excuses now for not accepting Christ. But beloved, when the day comes, and I believe this, I believe that non-believers know when God's speaking to them. They know when another Christian, when they see God working in that Christian's life, they can't deny it. They could not deny God's uh, protection of Daniel in that den. No matter how many skeptics there were, because of what had happened to those people that accused him. So, beloved, the Lord's going to get glory, and he's jealous of each one of you. You're his. You're his bride. And he loves you, and he will be glorified in your life, whatever that is. And people around are going to see God working in Frank's life. They're going to see God working in Laura's life. 
You won't. Most of the time, you won't, because you'd be pretty arrogant. But people are going to see the difference between your life and their life.